especially Mr. McMurray's systems analysis, systems analyst for Metropolitan Life Insurance, a licensed pilot. He also serves as a major at the Kansas Wing headquarters of the Civil Air Patrol. In April 94, he took the- August, that's Ms. Pratt. Ms. Pratt, yeah. In August of 94, he took the NSS tour of space sites in Russia. And I guess that was run by the Blue Heart Company. That's correct. Uh, and to Kazakhstan, including cosmonaut training facilities in Star City. Uh, his seat for the launch of the Progress rocket resupplying the Mir space station went much closer than his seat as a freelance reporter at the first launch of the space shuttle, space shuttle Columbia, as vividly recorded in the slideshow that we're about to see. Mr. McMurray's observations on Russia's capacity for contributing to lowered space station costs will provide a perspective on American efforts. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Um, I guess the first thing I would like to say before we, we start uh, the show is that I feel extraordinarily privileged for the opportunity to see things that I had been reading about or dreaming about since I was in junior high school at least. I never in my wildest dreams would have imagined that I could actually go to these places and see these things uh, and very nearly didn't get the chance to do so because uh, the, the NSS sponsored tours, there were originally supposed to be three of them, and the first one uh, was originally planned to include Buzz Aldrin, and uh, Dr. Aldrin couldn't join that tour group. That's the one I was originally scheduled to be on in April, and consequently the tour was canceled because when people heard that Buzz wasn't going to be there, they said forget it. The second tour also didn't fill up, so we were down to our last opportunity and there were only 11 people, I guess, that had the nerve to fly on Aeroflot after reading some of the things about Aeroflot. But uh, that turned out to be a fairly good thing because as a result of having a smaller group, we could direct things where we wanted to go rather than whether the tour guides wanted to take us, we could say, no, we'd rather go over here and see this, and, and being a small, cohesive group, we could get away with that, where a larger group would have had arguments about whether or not to do that. So we'll start out. This is, uh, I'll get the light, that's all right. This is my first view of St. Petersburg flying in. It's a uh, very European-looking city, and, and uh, I'm going to bang through this tray rather fast because there's not anything to do with space here in St. Petersburg, but I... I wanted to give you an idea of what else the tour consisted of because, believe it or not, there's more things in the world than rockets. And uh, I just wanted to give you a kind of a totality of, of the experience in Russia. We came in on a TU-134 from Shannon, Ireland. And you can see that the nose of the thing looks rather like a bomber. I'm not sure whether that particular design is converted from a bomber or not. These are our tour guides in St. Petersburg. Bus driver Yuri, oddly enough, and Katya. They still have their statues of Lenin up in St. Petersburg. They figure that good or bad, uh, communism is a part of their past and they're not going to rewrite history the way the, the communists did. All the pictures of Lenin you see have that same dramatic uh, arm outstretched into the future, uh, rather fierce looking. And, and the wind, of course, is blowing his coat. St. Petersburg is called uh, the Venice of the North, and here you can get a pretty good idea of why. It's situated at the mouth of the River Neva on the shore of the uh, North uh, Baltic Sea, and there are canals and uh, tributaries of the river just about everywhere. Very beautiful city, churches everywhere. This is the palace square behind the Winter Palace, the old uh, capital of Russia. Uh, with the, the statue of the Archangel Gabriel. This is where demonstrations were held uh, against the coup a couple of years ago. And this is the Winter Palace. This is the fortress of St. Peter and St. Paul, which was built by Peter the Great. Peter's own son died here under torture after he was implicated in a plot to overthrow his father. And it's been the site of uh, lots of political prisoners over the years. This is the statue of Peter the Great with flowers at the base. People, when they get married in St. Petersburg, come here to put flowers by the statue. 
This is St. Isaac's Cathedral. Statue of Alexander II, I believe. This is an old museum that is now a disco house, which tells you how things are changing in Russia today. The Kazan Cathedral, which houses a lot of uh, relics from the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, this is the Church of the Resurrection, which was built uh, in honor of Alexander II, the martyr czar. I guess that other horse statue was Alexander I. Took a lot of pictures here as though this was going to be the only church we would see. Little did we know. <laughs> that is real gold leaf, and they do have to replace it about every 60 years because it weathers off. See gold leaf everywhere. This is a portion of, of uh, the Hermitage, of which the Winter Palace is only one of five buildings. This little section here in the middle dates back to Peter the Great. And uh, Peter and Paul Fortress again across the river, looking from the Winter Palace, basically. Inside, uh, if you spent one minute at each exhibit in uh, the Winter Palace, it would take you 11 years to get through it. Very beautiful building. This is the Ambassador's Staircase. And uh, the lighting conditions were not good for you to, to really catch how, how ornate the interior of the building is by the staircase. This is one of the Tsar's thrones. This is uh, the ballroom. And the thing that's really neat about this room is that all of these chandeliers used to be lighted with candles. Now, if you took a uh, match and held it to each one of those candles individually, by the time you got finished, the last one would be burned down to nothing. So what they did was they wrapped fast burning thread around the wicks of all the candles and they would touch it off and fire would race around the room and light all the, all the uh, candles on the chandeliers at one time. Uh, Lapis Lazuli base. And, uh, this I believe is the throne room, or one of the throne rooms. And I'll let most of this pass without much comment. This is a very ornate peacock clock that used to have all kinds of things going. They don't have anybody to maintain it anymore. So it just sits there and doesn't do anything. The hanging gardens of Catherine the Great, which are not hanging over anything except horses' stables. Uh, and there's a Malachite base. Absolutely exquisite workmanship on, on uh, just about everything you see in the Hermitage. And this is just a detail off one of the doors. There are only 12 Da Vinci paintings left in the world, and Hermitage has two of them, both Madonnas. This is one, and that's the other. And there are a couple of Jasper columns for the Ural Mountains. This is the only Michelangelo statue I've ever had the opportunity to see in my life. It's not one of his better works. It's called Crouching Boy, oddly enough. And here's one of the hallways from one building to another. detail work of the ceiling. This is a Rembrandt of the turn of the prodigal son. This is the sacrifice of Abraham, I believe also by Rembrandt. If you folks remember in the news a few years ago, there was a nutcase that threw acid on one of the paintings in the Hermitage, and this is this uh, painting, fortunately not damaged. And there's looking out from the Winter Palace onto the Palace Square. One of the rooms in the Winter Palace is the room where the last democratic government of Russia was meeting and was arrested by the Bolsheviks. They had the clock stopped at 2.10 a.m. when the last government, democratic government was arrested in 1917. I, this picture is not very good because I had to sneak it. This was one of the few places where they really didn't want us to take pictures. Um, this is the throne of Nicholas II, the last czar of all the Russias. And looking out across the Naval River, you have these interesting uh, rostral columns. There's Peter and Paul again. There's the Winter Palace from, from a distance. And there I was, sure enough. These columns are pretty interesting. They, they were used as lighthouses, and they had these 
ornamental prows of Viking ships sticking out from them. Over each one of the windows in the Winter Palace, you had one of these. Rather charming. Here we are on the square. You can see St. Isaac's Cathedral from the square. There's a legend that if you touch the, the toe of, of the correct one of these statues and make a wish, your wish will be granted. But they don't tell you which one is the right one. There's St. Isaac's. Didn't get any pictures inside. It has some bomb damage left over from the Second World War, which they have not repaired as a reminder. I wish I had time to tell you more about this cathedral because it's really a, a miracle of engineering. Smolny Cathedral. There's an old church. The next day we visited uh, Catherine the Great's uh, summer cottage. Which is just a little ways outside St. Petersburg. This uh, furnace was made of, of Delft uh, chinaware, which was completely destroyed by the Germans. They occupied Catherine the Great's palace uh, during the siege of Leningrad. And uh, after you see the pictures of, of what uh, the Germans did to the palace uh, and how they totally trashed it, you kind of wish the atomic bomb might have been early a few months earlier. What they did was, was absolutely barbaric. Here is um, the study of Alexander I. The palace grounds were very nice, had, had nice gardens. We had our lunch there that day. It was cool, but we had better weather in Leningrad than we had, I, sh I should say, St. Petersburg. But the, the people themselves used the names interchangeably these days. They did uh, vote to change their name back to the old name of St. Petersburg, but old habits die hard. The weather was better in Leningrad, even though it was on the shore of the Baltic Sea, than it was in Moscow. Rain basically every day we were in Moscow. Now here you see the, the exhibit in uh, Leningrad to the fall of the Second World War. There's a big cult in Russia of the Great Patriotic War. The communists used that war basically to incite the people uh, to a memory of, of a time when they all suffered together for a common goal to, to defeat the foreign invaders and so on. It's almost a religious cult. Leningrad suffered more than most cities. Uh, it lost about half of its population during the 900 days. It was surrounded. One of the first things the Germans hit was the food supplies. And a lot of the people that died there died of starvation. One of Shostakovich's symphonies was, uh, here, here we have shots underneath in the museum, there's fresh flowers laid there every day. One of Shostakovich's symphonies was uh, performed for the first time in Leningrad while it was under siege and surrounded. And by the time uh, it was performed, half the orchestra had died of starvation. So they have real reason to remember that time even though most of that generation are dead now. Very powerful statuary. You can see here, uh, one of the details is that the workers are uh, doing gardening in their backyards to keep everybody alive and, and helping build the barricades and all that kind of thing. Clifford, mm -hmm. I've heard the big comment I've heard that uh, uh, did the Patriotic War, for every hundred Russians that went to fight, three returned. I didn't hear that, but it wouldn't surprise me if it were true. Then we took a cruise on the River Neva. One of the things we saw was the cruiser Aurora, which fired the first shot of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. On the bow, you can see the gun that started a century of tragedy for the Russian people and lots of other people as well.
Peter and Paul. Well, as we sailed past it, we could see people out here. It was pretty cold, but people were out in their bathing suits. I, I can't imagine swimming in that water. This is the Winter Palace, seen from the name of And there's a couple of Egyptian sphinxes. This really gets the impression that you're in a place like Venice. Here you see a couple of musicians on the boat demonstrating a logarithmic scale. <laughs> <laughs> that evening we went to a performance of, of Russian folk music and dance, and it was absolutely one of the best evenings I've ever spent in my life. There, Russian music and dance is, is, is very enthusiastic, and they punctuate it a lot with stomping. And, uh, Unfortunately, I couldn't really capture some of the uh, acrobatics that went on on stage very well. Um, but it was, it was just one of those moments in your life that you wish you could, could freeze forever and go back and, and recreate exactly for the rest of your life. It was wonderful. Here you see a stylized Cossack uh, sword fight and dance. Here we are entering the uh, Peter and Paul Fortress. There's the Romanov double eagle over the door, or the gate, I should say. This is the governor's palace where the more elite political prisoners were kept. And uh, the cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul houses the tombs of the czars. And this is the, uh, the uh, pulpit from which Leo Tolstoy was excommunicated. And, uh, okay, Catherine the Great's upper left, Peter the Great's lower right. What's left of them? This is a typical prison cell. Among other people who were kept here with, uh, in this prison was uh, Lenin's brother and Maxim Gorky, who wrote a novel while he was in prison. And we got up on the battlements of the fort. It is a was a fort, it's not used as a fort today, but they do have some rather large field pieces up on the walls. Here we are on board the Aurora. This is the breach of the gun. Something enormously phallic about that picture. This is the radio room from which the order to begin the revolution was broadcast at Lenin's command, the bridge. Another statue of Lenin. You'll always get that arm out there. Overnight train to Moscow. This was our first view of the Kremlin, which you can see it is a fortress. It began as a fortress. Uh, soldiers marching on Red Square. Incidentally, Red Square was not named for the communists. Red in Russian kind of is equated with beauty, so it's a beautiful square. And. Uh, St. Basil's, which is probably the most archetypically known building in Russia. St. Basil's Cathedral. And right down here, up, up the driveway where we were, is where the, uh, that crazy German kid in the stealth Cessna uh, landed and taxied up onto uh, Red Square. The Russian people themselves had a pretty good sense of humor about the whole thing. There's Sherman Yevo 1 International Airport, Sherman Yevo 2, and now after the stealth Cessna landed, uh, they call Red Square Sherman Yevo 3 International Airport. <laughs> this is their, their big Gung department store, their showpiece store, which honestly is not much by our standards. It's a mall. Yeah, there's, there's where he taxied up after he had landed in a Cessna 172. This is Lenin's tomb uh, with probably a plastic or, or a wax dummy <laughs> instead of a body at this point. I will be amazed if, uh, if Lenin's body stays on display there another five years. There used to be huge lines. Uh, when we were there, there were no lines whatsoever. You could just walk on in. They still have the military guard? Oh, yes, they certainly do, and I nearly got in trouble with them. And we'll show you that they, they stopped fairly recently. They stopped Did they? The military guard? Yes. 
This little building back here is a brand new church. New churches are going up in Russia now. Uh, and this is the old Lenin Museum. A red building appropriately. And if you had your binoculars, you could see that that was me standing in front of Lenin's tomb. <laughs> Here's their uh, eternal flame to the memory of, of uh, the dead in the Great Patriotic War. Uh, speaking of the cult of the Great Patriotic War, to give you some idea how this cult, how deeply this cult is rooted, newlyweds come to the eternal flame with, to lay flowers here. Here's an obelisk that used to have the names of the czars on it. When Lenin took power, he had them all sanded off and the names of, of uh, prominent communists put on it. Gives you some idea of his sense of history. Here we are inside the department store, Goom. Big place. They have a fountain in the middle. If you get lost, you just go to the fountain and wait to rendezvous with whoever. And there you see this, the uh, stand in Red Square, the little podium on which were uh, made public announcements and your occasional public execution. Now, believe it or not, we are going to see some hardware here pretty quickly. August of, of last year. Was there for, for two weeks. Here we are. There's the Kremlin Palace where uh, Boris Yeltsin lives today. You can see, looking across the Moskva River, the walls of the fortress, the old fortress of the Kremlin. This was one of the, the sites that really cheered the heart of an unrepentant cold warrior like myself, how the mighty have fallen. Uh, here you have a statue of Zerzhinsky, the founder of the KGB, and lots of other statues of, of big communist leaders all, all hauled out like trash behind the Trechikov art gallery, fallen on their side and so on. They said that uh, Zerzhinsky uh, was kind to widows and orphans, and, and that was probably a good thing since he made so many of them. Stalin lying on his side. Spared Lava on the left, the guy who ordered the execution of the royal family. What are they doing? They just didn't have any place else to put them. They, they didn't want them up on public display anymore. There was a little story about that, about uh, uh, a, a Russian woman taking her little boy through there. He was asking, Mama, what is this place? And she said, a graveyard. Yeah. So. <laughs> and let's have, raise a glass to that thought. Anyway, right across the street from the Trechikov Art Gallery, by the way, there were lots of, of artists out on the streets with beautiful work, which you could not buy because you couldn't get it through customs. Any artwork they were afraid was, might have been painted over an old master to get it out or something like that. So it was really kind of a racket. If you bought something, they'd confiscate it from you and put it back there, and somebody else would buy it then. As may be. Right across the street from the Trechikov Gallery uh, was Gorky Park, which we wanted to see not so much for any connection with the novel, because this place is basically an amusement park, but because we knew that there was a, an old uh, Buran test article, which they've hauled into Gorky Park. It's sitting there uh, out in the elements, rusting away. They plan to turn it into a restaurant. It's not actually being converted yet. Not at that time. I don't know what's happened in the last year. There's another statue of Lenin. There we were. But here you begin to get the idea of, of the second element of communist civil religion, man as Superman. This is the statue of Yuri Gagarin, erected at the point where he made his official report to the party leaders on his return from his Earth orbital flight. Uh, a little bit of trivia for you. Who, uh, who was the first man to orbit the Earth? You are wrong, Muspret, as Johnny Carson used to say. It was actually Germán Titov. Uh, Gagarin landed a thousand kilometers short of a full orbit. He was the first man injected into an orbital trajectory, but he didn't make a com one complete orbit. Contrary to what uh, the Russians told the, uh, or the 
the uh, Soviets told the uh, International Certification Group. Anyway, you can begin to see here man as Superman. The arms aren't quite out to universal man and the cross yet, but they're getting there. Uh, this is the old Olympic stadiums from 1984. This is the University of Moscow. It has this, there are about half a dozen or more of these buildings <coughs> which are, you might best term Stalinist Gothic architecture. Moscow would be a great city to film a Batman movie. Um, there is a saying in Russian which translates, all things flow to the center. Moscow is the center of everything, politically, culturally, economically, for education, you name it. It's, it's like New York and Chicago and L.A. and, uh, yeah, all that thrown into one city uh, in terms of its power and influence. And a good, good segment of the population lives there. All of our trips, aside from the trip down to Baikonur, were no more than a couple hours away from our hotel. All the space facilities were within easy distance of Moscow. Yes, they do have one there. No, we didn't go in. We went to the circus. Uh, one of the members of our party unfortunately got his pocket picked that night. That's a pretty good trick, don't you think? And the next day we visited Zvezny Gorodok, Star City, the, their equivalent of, the, of them. Well, it's, it's tough because none of their centers really correspond to anything we have. This is their campus portion of, of the manned spacecraft center. Um, it's like Houston in that this is where the cosmonauts train, unlike the Johnson Space Center in that they actually live there in apartment buildings, also unlike the Johnson Space Center in that the, it's surrounded by barbed wire. This is the cosmonauts office building. Some of the glass on the doors was broken out. Looked like it had, had been broken out for some time with nobody bothering to replace it. Star City looked something like a ghost town. We were there on a weekday, not very many people out and about. I don't know if they were all off tending their gardens or what. Here we're getting a lecture on the Mir space station. Our translator, uh, Sergei, was really kind of out of his depth, and that was one of the more unfortunate things about the tour. Sergei is an art historian. He has basically uh, a quite limited technical vocabulary but he was the only one they could come up with at a price they could afford to translate for us. So he was really struggling and, and not having a very good time, a little bit out of his depth. And the interesting thing is that every once in a while he would just get to a point where he would kind of throw up his hands and then the person he'd been, he had been translating for would start speaking in English at that point. So they, the protocol was go through the translator if you can. You can see their uh, couches are a little bit different from ours in the position that they launch in. Also, those are uh, individually molded to the contours uh, of an individual cosmonaut. And they will actually trade couches out from one vehicle to, the, to another when they take a Soyuz up to, to rendezvous with Mir and uh, leave that capsule and take the one that's been up there for a while back to Earth. They will take their couches out of the one and put them in the other one. Uh, so that they will have their own couch. There's uh, a mock-up of the mirror in which uh, Ulf Merbold was training the day that we were there. He, he was launched in October uh, to mirror for about 30 days, I believe, was the length of the stay, along with Elena Kondakova, who set a, an endurance record for women in space. We did not meet either one of those. We did see Maribold around the campus. Not a whole lot to say about these except there's various angles down there on the floor. Stained glass in one of the buildings at, at uh, Star City. Again, it goes back to the idea of, of cosmonautics as a civil religion. Their newest building on the campus was the Buran Center, 
which has been mothballed, of course, because they're not going to fly Boron again. Built this great big new building and then abandoned it before they had a chance to use it even once. Like our astronauts, the cosmonauts train in an underwater tank. Here we're getting a lecture on the suit they use for their uh, neutral buoyancy tank. They have a kind of an interesting philosophy in spacesuit design. They, did, they figure that all uh, cosmonauts are roughly the same torso dimension, and the only thing they have to worry about adjusting are the arm length of the arms and the legs. So they, they have a standard torso, and the arms and the legs are, are adjustable with, with uh, laces. They can lace them up to various lengths, and they have a clamshell back for getting in and out. Their underwater training facility, again, looked like it had been a while since it had been used. They've got a very interesting design. Their, their pool is underneath this, and they've got holes in the elevator on the floor. So they can just raise the whole floor up and put whatever they want in. And then they will lower the, the whole stage, the whole room as an elevator, will lower that into the pool, and the water will flow up through the holes in the floor. Rather ingenious. Looked a little rusty. This is their. Um, give me a hand here. I'm drawing one. Planetary. Thank you. Is that a size projector? I can't answer that. They didn't say. Uh, in the center of the room is uh, a capsule that has the controls for uh, boron and mirror, and also for Soyuz, although I didn't get pictures of the control panels for them. I believe this is the, the mirror simulator building. Here they have one of their training centrifuges, which can spin you up to 30 Gs. The arm weighs 300 tons and uh, runs at 28 megawatts of power. It's loaded from the front end. And here's one of the apartment buildings. In front of Yuri Gagarin's apartment building, uh, there's a less heroic statue of him at which the cosmonauts are, uh, traditionally lay flowers on their return, on their safe return to Earth. There are lots of, of uh, customs and traditions and rituals, uh, again, almost religious rituals that have grown up in, in the Soviet manned space program, a lot more so than in our own. Does his wife and family live there with him, or is that more like a Gagarin died in 67 in a jet crash. Well, I mean, uh, families live there. Uh, yes, they do. They do live there. Some other apartment buildings there. This is uh, Sergei Korolev's good luck jacket that he wore at all of his launches. Uh, Korolev was roughly their equivalent of, of Werner von Braun. He was a brilliant man, narrowly escaped death in the Stalinist labor camps, uh, and eventually died, rumor has it, at, uh, as the result of his surgeon being drunk when he was being operated on for stomach ulcers. But uh, the man was was a genius, and the world really lost something when it lost Korolev. Here's uh, one of the books written by Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, which is their uh, Robert Goddard, their theoretician. This book was flown on the Apollo Soyuz mission in '75. There's Gagarin's suit that he actually wore on the first uh, space flight. As you can see, we are now in their museum in Star City. And there is the Valentina Tereshkova's suit, the first woman in space. This is the Soyuz 4 capsule, the first capsule to successfully make a, a uh, docking between two manned spacecraft. 
in January of 1969, just a few months before we did the same thing with Apollo 9. Looking inside to their control panel, you can, you can see that it's uh, pretty austere, for want of a better word. This is Gagarin's dress uniform. Maybe I should sit. Get out of people's way a little bit. This is a model of the house in which Yuri Gagarin grew up. This model was created by a, uh, a young man during a, an extended illness, uh, working in bed with uh, matchsticks. And the young man eventually did die, but not before he completed this little uh, memorial to Gagarin. Here you have a really unusual phone, telephone, that was created uh, for the Apollo Soyuz mission here. You can see the, the dial face and the body of the phone is, is the Earth, and the receiver is Apollo Soyuz. And if we had this room really, really dark, you could, you could see these suits better. These are the, uh, the flight suits of the Soyuz 11 crew, the first crew to actually die in space when their capsule depressurized. They were not wearing pressure suits, just these jumpsuits. This is the Holy of Holies, Yuri Gagarin's office. Again, the clock on the wall is stopped at the time at which he died in 1967 in a jet crash. Here was one of the most tragic sites to me because the, the Russians are, are trying to catch on to the idea of capitalism and profit and so on, but they just haven't quite got the idea yet. Right here, right off of Yuri Gagarin's desk, they were selling fairly poor quality commemorative calendars of Gagarin for one stinking Yankee dollar a piece. Now the first thing you want to say to him is make it five bucks a piece. The second thing you want to say to him is you might want to think about moving your gift shop out of the museum itself. <coughs> but they're trying and, and I really wish that, uh, that we could get them some more financial help. On our way back we saw some uh, deep space tracking antennas. <laughs> Again, just on uh, Star City is, is maybe an hour's drive from downtown Moscow. Where is that? This is just uh, looking out from our bus on the highway as we drove <coughs> back in from Star City to downtown. The station or radio I'm not certain. They're flying saucers. <laughs> right. I wanted to give you some feel for how, how truly wretchedly bad construction is in Russia. These, a lot of these buildings look like they were, were put together by a child with, with a, a tube of paste or, or a toothpaste or something and, and glued together. Uh, the Russian word for these buildings is Khrushchova because Khrushchev had a big building program to, to give housing to the masses. So their word for these apartment complexes uh, is a combination of Khrushchev's name and the Russian word for slum. You get some idea here. I wish I had captured the building that had this huge, huge crack down the side of it. Unbelievable. It looked like the building was going to split in half like that. Uh, this is the view from our hotel window. Which hotel did you stay in? Uh, we stayed at the Ismailova Hotel, which was created for the Moscow Olympic Games in 1984. And it looks a bit different. You can see they're trying to impress the foreign visitors. This is a 10,000 bed hotel. Outside the hotel were kiosks. Kiosks lined the streets both in Leningrad and, uh, and in Moscow. And in them you could buy the, the three main Russian food groups, booze, candy, and cigarettes. Here's another new church under construction. Along the roads outside of Moscow are these dachas. 
Everybody has a dacha, be he rich or poor. It's part of their back to nature movement. Also, it's kind of a class leveling thing. You can, you can say that you have a dacha and nobody knows whether it's just a little shack that you've constructed out of surplus lumber or whether it's Leonard, Leonard Brezhnev's dacha, you know, a, a palace out there in the countryside. So it's, it's kind of a class leveling thing. Kind of like the retreats. So. Yeah, it's, it's back to nature. They like to get out there also and work their gardens. That's where the gardens are located. Yeah. The city yeah. That's nice. This is uh, Sergei of Kosad, the holiest site in Russia, monastery, where Peter the Great took refuge from his sister while she was trying to overthrow him. Uh, near here is their engine testing site which is the only place on the tour that we were not allowed to photograph at all. And the reason I think that we were not allowed to photograph it is not that there was anything all that secret there, but because the Russians were embarrassed by what condition it was in. It literally looked like an Aztec ruin. Rusting things growing up out of the jungle, more or less. So, at Sergei of Posad, they have the family uh, tomb of Boris uh, Godunov, and I had to explain to our tour guide at that point about Boris Badenov and Bullwinkle. <laughs> and he took it in pretty good humor, I think. <laughs> in Moscow itself is the Space Obelisk, which is a, a lovely Hugo Gernsback type uh, monument. Just a beautiful, beautiful monument. I, I couldn't take enough pictures of it. Now, here we are. We, we truly have made it to Universal Man. This is inside the museum, mind you. Portrait of a cosmonaut with the helmet. The arms are out. He's all the way out to Universal Man now, stained glass in the background. And if that is not a church, I don't know what it is. <laughs> this is uh, one of the Vostok capsules that was an unmanned precursor. Uh, flight to, to the man Vostok, standing next to it is one of your Gagarin's training suits. And here's a picture of a Luna probe, although you can't see that very well. It was awfully dark in there. There's uh, one of their Mars probes. <coughs> Anybody remember Bekla and Strekla, the dogs? Here they are, stuffed and mounted beside their Cool! Oh, oh my god. Carl's little dogs was in Minneapolis last month. Now on a display with Mir. Really? Yes, the dog, it souped the whole shebang. Wow. Okay. Now I should say that um, some of the stuff in this museum, I'm not sure as to what its status was, as to a genuine flight article or uh, something that had actually been flown or not. For instance, they told me that this universal docking adapter, Apollo Soyuz docking adapter, was the one that had actually flown. And that's clearly impossible. I don't know whether they failed to make the distinction, whether it was a translation difficulty, or whether the tour guide just didn't know what they were talking about. But uh, some of this stuff, when I say this is the article, you might take that with a grain of salt. Here is uh, supposedly the flown article of Alexei Leonov's um, EVA suit when he made the first successful EVA in 19, or the first EVA in 1964. Uh, in the foreground is uh, a more modern cosmonaut uh, attire. This one supposedly was worn by uh, Svetlana Savitskaya, their first female cosmonaut since Tereshkova. She did the first EVA by a woman. And in the background here, you have the inflatable airlock that was, was uh, of the type used on Voshkod 2, where Leonov nearly died trying to get back inside because he couldn't make his pressure suit fit back in. Had to partially depressurize his suit in order to gain enough mobility to get back inside and, and made it with only a couple of minutes of oxygen to spare. and things with and without flash, so that's the only difference. I wasn't after that before they learned to use restraints on the suits, and he was basically like this. Yeah, he had some problems. 
Uh, he had a great time until they tried to get back in. On the sides of the of the uh, monument, you see the the march, the glorious march into the future of technology. You you have some people over there on the left for scale. Gives you some idea how big the thing is. Are those little squares still in, or is that all hollow? Which squares? The of the monument itself. It looks like a spider's web. Is that hollow? It's hard to tell. Uh, it's. Is there material in there? Yeah, oh yes. Yes, there is. I don't know what the material is. I wish we had a, a uh, space monument that that was even uh, half as impressive as what they have. Out in front is, is a statue of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky the father of modern rocketry, in, in a theoretical sense, at least. Next day, we took a tour of the uh, Moscow subway, which is one of their uh, pride and joys. They started construction in 1935 and continued construction during World War II, even when the Germans were knocking at the gates of Moscow. Uh, you had 8 million riders a day. You can ride all day long for 150 rubles. At least you could last year. It's probably 300 rubles this year. What's and, that worth? Um, pennies. Mm. Pennies. Uh, they have each station of, of the subway system is decorated in a different motif. It's uh, absolutely spotless. There's no graffiti. I, I have the feeling that if anybody tried to spray graffiti, he would be beaten to death in, in a matter of minutes by the babushkas. <laughs> and here you see another one of the stations of the chandeliers. They have statuary, they have paintings, mosaics, you name it, they've got it. <coughs> we used the subway system to get back to, to Red Square in order to go through Lenin's tomb. Both because you have to do that. I mean, you can't go to Moscow and not visit Lenin's tomb. And, but the main reason was you had to pay, quote unquote, pay your respects to Lenin in order to get through Lenin's tomb and back to the Kremlin wall, where the really interesting people are buried. People like Korolev, the Soyuz 11 crew, Kamarov. There, there's uh, the marker on the wall for uh, Sergei Pavlovich Korolev, died in 1966, January 14th. I wasn't quite sure whether they would allow me to take pictures back here, and uh, the guard got quite upset with me when I did, so I didn't go any further at that point in, in uh, taking pictures of any of the rest of the Kremlin wall. That's the picture that, that nearly got me in the worst trouble. The next day we attended an air show, this hind pilot was absolutely gonzo in some of the things he did. There's a MiG-29. They must have loved that. Yeah. The trouble was that, it, as I said, it rained in Moscow every day. So uh, they had to put on a really flat show. They couldn't do any extended vertical maneuvers. The sky was just dripping. Their safety standards are definitely different than ours because they had aircraft over the crowds. You would never see that here. One of the things you can say about Russia, it's got a lot of problems, but the lawyers haven't made it there yet. <laughs> I never felt unsafe, but uh, they definitely did things that uh, you would never see here in the States. The biggest uh, parachute jump I've ever seen at one time was at this air show. I think more right away that would be things you haven't seen here in a long time. Well, that's true. That's true. As you can see, the hind pilot was really strutting his stuff. Back to the, the uh, museums in the Kremlin for that afternoon. This is the Palace of the Congresses. Uh, a lot of people in Moscow were really upset with that building because they tore down some really historic and beautiful buildings to put up that modern monstrosity for the for the communist car. Uh, Congresses. Uh, this is the Kremlin Armory. Lots of Napoleonic cannons stored around there. there this is the church dates back. The foundation was laid in 1326. Lots of lots of uh, old churches in that part of the Kremlin. And I can't resist telling you this story. I love this story. Ivan the Terrible had eight wives. He was excommunicated after the fourth. So he couldn't go to church, right? So in 
So he had a, a, a wing built onto this church privately to him so that he could go and there was a window in which he could look into the church. He could be in the church without being in the church. <laughs> it would be unthinkable to have a czar that couldn't go to church after all. And as I said, it rained every day. This cannon is purely ornamental. You can, you can see that the balls are, are too big to fit into the bore of the gun. <laughs> but it's a beautiful piece of work anyway. And uh, this is the building in which uh, Stalin used to live in the left rear. The Germans very nearly made it to Moscow in the Second World War. This stylized anti-tank barricade uh, monument to their point of closest approach to Moscow, if it's not in the city limits, it's just pretty darn close. Here we are at the entrance to one of the buildings at the Institute for Biomedical Research. I took this picture because I just purely couldn't believe what sorry shaped the building was in. By the way, this uh, was the host of the tour company in, that was working with Blue Heart in Russia. And uh, Alex, Alexander, Sasha, uh, he's an Afghanistani veteran of, of the uh, Soviet war in Afghanistan and one of the nicest people I have uh, had a chance to meet in recent years. I really like him a lot. Here we are. Uh, taking a look at the interior of one of the centrifuges. Supposedly, this is the centrifuge uh, on which Gagarin and the first cosmonauts trained. <coughs> then, again, I mean, just look at this, this architecture. You can, you can see the seams, it's like they've got glue squished out from between the, the bricks here. This is the entrance to their uh, institute, their biomedical research institute. Here we have a hyperbaric chamber which had absolutely nothing to do with the space program, but it looked technical and uh, they, they wanted to fill some time, I think. In their museum, we see a research capsule for carrying dogs and rats. <laughs> and here we see uh, their Chimis uh, lower body negative pressure suit. And then back here, we have the penguin suit that they use for muscle toning while they're on extended uh, missions. At the Institute, they have a, a uh, separate control center for the doctors who work with the personnel on Mir. This is entirely separate from the mission control center. They like it that way, the doctors say, because they can have more private conversations with the crews about their medical situations and medical problems without everybody else in the world listening in. Their consoles. Uh, once again, look look uh, pretty primitive by our standards, but they do get the job done. They had a mascot. Every place we went had a mascot. And this was quite interesting. Uh, one of the places we visited, uh, they were practicing uh, telerobotic docking, uh, remote control docking of uh, a progress capsule with the Mir space station. They were simulating this on 12-year-old Motorola PCs. And, and uh, it turned out that the progress launch we saw also had a problem. And uh, the cosmonauts on board Mir had to take over using similar software to this to guide that progress into a successful docking uh, after we had, uh, were on our way home. Again, another Stalinist Gothic building. I still say this would be Moscow would be a great place to film a Batman movie.
This is the uh, Russian White House, their parliament building that Boris Yeltsin ordered shelled. You can still see some of the windows are, are uh, blasted out from the, the shelling. It has not been reoccupied. There's uh, their memorial arch to the successful conclusion of the Napoleonic War. And this, it has since that time, since the Germans invaded, come to be more of a generic victory arch over foreign oppression, foreign invaders. Here we are at uh, the Krivichev plant. And uh, we, we were about to enter hog heaven, portion of the tour for us got to walk through a model of the mirror, and this is the assembly line for the proton boosters. As you can see, it is not a white room environment at all. It's your basic warehouse. Here are the controls inside the mirror, the main control panel. And here we are looking into uh, part two, I believe. They're going to be launching the Spectre module this month. And this is one of our group out on the assembly line proper. <coughs> Protons are interesting vehicles because they look like they have strap-ons and they don't. Uh, that's all integral tankage. Did not drop, drop away. Here we are looking at the docking port on the Crystal module where the shuttle Atlantis will dock next month. That's looking out away from the module. This is the one place where they got excited with me. Uh, we asked what this was, and uh, the phrase has evidently made it that far. Our, our uh, tour guide said, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> this, in point of fact, is a piece of Almaz, which is an unmanned version of their Salute space station, uh, which was used for radar reconnaissance. I found that out later. Couldn't get them to tell me at the time. Here we have... Uh, one of the uh, flight test articles for the Mir-2, which will be a component of our Space Station Alpha. Technicians working on it. Here's the forward docking port of the Space Station, where the Soyuz normally docks. Mir has a really interesting setup for carrying oxygen up. They, they don't carry uh, pressurized oxygen up to the station. They carry water up and electrolyze it and keep the uh, oxygen and throw away the hydrogen. This allows them to uh, carry non-pressurized containers and uh, in keep their uh, supply material in smaller volumes. So this is the water electrolysis apparatus on the uh, font 2 module controls in the COT2. Uh, this is either part of the electrolysis apparatus or water storage. I'm not quite sure at this point. You try and take good notes and then you can't read them when you get back. You know how that is. Here we are uh, sitting next to the uh, proton. <coughs> As you can see, we had at least one member on our tour who, who uh, ate his Wheaties a lot, very tall man, Dick Van Effen. And uh, as I say, these look like strap-ons, but they're really integral tankage. Uh, they do not fall away. And another interesting feature of the Proton is that they fuel it from the bottom up. They don't have their valves to the fuel tanks on top. They have them on the bottom, and they pump the fuel up from below. This is the view that uh, the crew of Atlantis will have as they dock with Mir next month, coming in on the docking port on uh, the Crystal module.
here I am uh, sitting next to uh, the second stage, the interstage of the second stage of the proton. Another interesting feature of the proton is that they have hot separation, so they don't have to do it, uh, uh, a knowledge burn. They start burning the second stage before the first stage drops away. Now here's another piece of Almaz that I kind of took covertly because I knew they didn't want me taking pictures of it. Uh, it the thing about Almaz is that at one time it was intended to be manned. Uh, they, they had a re-entry capsule that looked very much like an Apollo command module sitting, sitting on this thing. And you can barely uh, discern the cone shape underneath there. Here we are looking at uh, the Mir-2 module technicians working on it. Oh, core module. And here we are looking back along the full length of the factory floor. This is our group, and it, it's a very interesting group because there was not a single one of them that's in uh, the aerospace business professionally. We had uh, Jack and Sarah Elliott. Uh, Jack's a re retired engineer, uh, maybe from Marietta, I'm not sure. Uh, who lives, they live down in Cape Canaveral now. Dick Van Eppen's a chemist. Uh, Charles and Heidi Cooks Cardos were hotel owners in British Columbia. Uh, myself, we've got uh, Roger, who was uh, a high school chemistry teacher. And uh, let's see, I don't know where Bill is. He, uh, he works for the Defense Department. And uh, I can't think of this guy's name, but he's an architect. So it was it was really the grassroots of NSS that made this trip. Here we are at the uh, Lavochkin factory. Lavochkin was a, a really big manufacturer of fighter aircraft during the Second World War, and they've done unmanned space hardware since then. Here you see a model of, of a vertically launched air-breathing cruise missile that has a rather similar configuration. Let's see if we can get it down a little better. Uh, rather similar configuration to the shuttle, but with, and this thing was designed back in the 50s. And then they have a little museum, just a little hole in the wall of the factory uh, museum of their unmanned hardware. Uh, lots of the lunar and planetary probes. Here you see Luna 13, uh, which is basically an identical probe, or very close to identical to Luna 9, which made the first successful soft landing on the moon. Here you see their generic descent stage. When they realized that they weren't going to beat us onto the moon with men, they came up with uh, an unmanned program that could uh, could do some fairly interesting things, and, and this was a generic descent stage to be used for an ascent stage like this for sample return of a few ounces of soil. You can see here, this is about the, the size of a basketball, and you have your drill and sample arm here that, that loads it this way and swings down to the soil to pick up. This, I guess, is going to be as close as I get to touching the moon for a while. This is one of their actual sample return capsules, I believe, off of Luna 21, which, uh, again, is very different from the way things would be done here in the States. There's no museum in the United States that would let you touch something like that. The other thing they flew on that generic descent stage was uh, Luna Cod remotely operated uh, surface rover. Here's their Mars 3 probe with its aero shell behind it, uh, which made the first successful soft landing on Mars, but unfortunately landed uh, at a time of really intense dust storms back at the same time, I believe, as Mariner 9. And uh, they lost <coughs> contact with it after just a few seconds on the ground. Didn't get any useful data out of it at all. <coughs> I took several pictures of this thing because I was just rather impressed with it. 
fairly good sized arrow shell made out of balsa wood, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Then it's got some sort of styrofoam shell around the body of it as well to cushion it. The Russian attitude toward the Cold War is, is just a little bit different than what you would find here in the States. Here you see battle flags, Cold War battle flags, awarded uh, to the Lavochkin factory for its efforts in, uh, against the United States in, in the Cold War. Here you see probably the most infamous building on the planet today, Lubyanka Prison. Uh, infamous not so much for the number of people that died here, but uh, for the number of people whose, whose deaths were orchestrated from here. You can see there's this empty plaza out front. That's where that uh, statue of Zerzhinsky used to sit. I imagine that he was one of the first ones they pulled down. We did not ask for a guided tour inside here, thank you. Here's their mission control room in Kaliningrad. Compared to our uh, manned spacecraft center's uh, control room, it's quite large. You can see on the screen uh, a couple of things. They were simulating uh, the progress launch the next day to Mir, which we were going to view once we got down to uh, Baikonur. And then, of course, they had their position of Mir on the wall screen so that you could tell where it was. It was out of communication at that time. Pretty big room. Again, they had a nice large, even more modern room for uh, controlling Buran flights, which will now never be used. Mothball. How welcome were we there? How welcome were we there? Oh, quite welcome. I, I thought that, uh, by and large, that we were treated very well. I, per, in my personal dealings with the Russian people, I think that they uh, rooked me a couple of times on the exchange rate, but I can't really blame them considering their situation. I found the Russian people to be very friendly. Here's, here's the statue commemorating the Union of Workers and Peasants outside their exhibition of economic achievement, which, uh, or lack thereof, as the case may be. We went there to see a full-scale model of the Semyorka booster that lost, uh, launched uh, Yuri Gagarin, although his was painted uh, matte green, I believe, military green. This is the one they have on display there. You can see here the reason why we beat the Russians to the moon. They had these rather, uh, for the time, large engines, uh, and they had mastered the technique of clustering them together, but as you cluster more and more engines together, you have to lift more and more weight of the engines themselves. So they were never able to develop a cryogenic stage for really high-performance engines the way we were, and that basically lost them the race to the moon, the manned race. I mean. Anyway, I've, I've got about five minutes left, so all at most. Okay, inside here, uh, you've got uh, a Vostok model. In the background, the Apollo Soyuz, you've got pigeon droppings on top of the Soyuz, so that they're not really maintaining the exhibits that well here. Great metaphor. They used to, their space program used to be their pride and joy. Now all their space hardware is pushed off to one side to make room for an exhibit of foreign car manufacturers. Back to the uh, Tsiolkovsky, uh, or to the space obelisk for a couple of minutes. You can see once again Lenin pointing the way into the glorious future. If you look in this guy's arms here, you will see that his arms are filled with beer cans. Uh, this is the square on which the kid landed in the Cessna 172 and taxied on the red square. He led a charmed life because there are wires all over the top of that bridge. Here we are on our way down to Baikonur. My 
pilot's license was a, a ticket to sit in the, in the pilot seat for a couple of minutes. The pilot was a very nice guy, spoke excellent English, had been trained on Gulfstream jets here in the United States. And uh, here, here we're beginning to see uh, Asia. This was just a day trip down and back to see the launch, and then it was our last day. We had lunch at the Hotel Baikonur where the cosmonauts stayed before their trip. Wonderful meal, although I, for the trip as a whole, the cuisine was not great. Uh, this is a fragment of Vostok 1. The ID badges of the original cosmonauts on display. There's Gagarin and Tito. Some of the original hardware used to launch Vostok 1. In the logbook of their astrogation officer on the launch crew, there is this entry, a man in space, yippee. There's your proof that the, the Russians really were in a race to the moon with us uh, to land men on the moon. This is a model of their N1 booster, which never successfully flew. They never managed to get it past the first two minutes or, uh, of the first stage. Here you have, again, a, a basically no white room at all, a warehouse in which uh, their Soyuz and Progress vehicles are checked out. Uh, here you see the Soyuz in a, a uh, test harness. They're checking it out. This is the one that launched uh, Kondakova and uh, Mayor Bold last November. I understand there was a fire in this building after we left at some point. These are the, the stations on which the cosmonauts report that they're officially report that they're ready to fly. It really had to be done. And you have uh, Gagarin's house and uh, Korolev's cottage right next door to each other. And unfortunately I didn't get any pictures inside because I had my telephoto lens on. I wish I could have showed you Yuri Gagarin's bed because the hero of the Soviet Union slept on a bed this wide. That's uh, Gagarin's house, I believe. And here we are inside the Energia assembly building. I have never felt so dwarfed next to any human artifact, as including the Saturn V, which I have stood next to. This is just one whale machine. This is the uh, Energia uh, launch facility. And now, it was getting on close to dark. I didn't know how these pictures were going to come out. Uh, this was, after all, the reason that I had taken the trip was to see a launch from Baikonur. And I'll let you be the judge as to what results I got. I call that my $3,500 picture. <laughs> I think you can see why. Going. going. Hey, uh, we got a time constraint. We have to get the next okay. program in here. Okay. You were just about done five minutes ago. We yeah, have the hotel till three. Okay. And that's we're it. Going. Our group. Sunset on lovely Baikonur. And that's it. Thank you.